After dominating rock radio in the 1970s, uh, today's legendary band, this rock band, they, they fell from grace. What can you say? They, it was a complete facepalm. Um, their records didn't sell. They were a mess as a band. Most people considered them a joke in the music business. They were completely written off. And a few years later, they waged a comeback from the strangest place. And their first big hit back as a band came from their legendary singer hitting on a beautiful girl. Problem is, it was actually the front man of a rival band. And that's what he wrote the song about, this big hit. Very funny story coming up. It's one of three huge hits from this record. The story of the craziest comeback of the 80s is coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you uh, ever snuck your uh, Walkman headphones into class and uh, listened when the teacher wasn't looking, you're gonna dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe right now uh, to get the stories behind the songs and click the bell. That way you get all of our videos. We do it daily. And we also have a Patreon that you can look at. Uh, there you'll get more content and you can be a producer and be listed on our channel. That really helps us keep this a daily channel. Also see our newest merch, including our Vintage Years collection at professorofrock.com. So in the mid 70s, uh, Aerosmith was often referred to as America's greatest rock and roll band. But by 1980, uh, the abuse of drugs, alcohol, and obstinate egos severely fractured the once ferocious brigade. Joe Perry, the instrumentalist that created the amazing guitar riffs of some of the most memorable rock tracks of the 1970s, he bitterly left the group in 1979. Rhythm guitarist Brad Whitford exited in 81, and uh, Aerosmith began a steady decline from their status as a multi-platinum act. Now, the band stumbled into a reunion in 1985, but it proved uh, uneventful. Their album, Done With Mirrors, that was supposed to be their big comeback. Music, do the uh, Joe Perry rejoined after a five-year absence, and Brad Whitford returned from a four-year hiatus. I mean, Aerosmith had their classic lineup back, uh, with the core members of the band's glory days of the 70s intact. Despite the band's high hopes, Done With Mirrors uh, sort of lived up to its title as an uninspired mechanical album that fell flat with the record-buying public at the time. It quickly disappeared. Instead of celebrating uh, the big comeback for Aerosmith when Done With Mirrors flopped, the industry was ready to stick a fork in Aerosmith, as it were, predicting that the bad boys of Boston were, in effect, done. There's no question that Aerosmith still had the talent to get back to the top of the mountain. And I'm a big believer in the old adage, uh, once a threat, always a threat. I mean, never underestimate the heart and will of a champion. <music> to reclaim the title as America's greatest rock band, first and foremost, Aerosmith needed to uh, get their crap together. Then they needed the right career navigation from someone outside of the band. And uh, thirdly, they needed a lucky break, like most bands do. That break came with their landmark collaboration with Run DMC on the hip-hop rock mutation uh, of their 1974 hit Walk This Way. I mean, it was a pop culture phenomenon that impacted uh, the entire planet. We covered that in an earlier video, the whole story, you can watch that. We'll link to it uh, at the end of the video here. Now, while the Run DMC Redux of Walk This Way was rocketing up the charts, uh, the band went into rehab and they got clean and sober at that point. The third component for their historic comeback, that came to fruition with the navigation of visionary Geffen Records artist and repertoire executive, John Kaladner. On the heels of their collaboration with Run DMC, uh, Aerosmith was back in the limelight, brighter than they had ever been. Up to the release of Walk This Way, Aerosmith hadn't received uh, any MTV exposure. And their last hit single was actually the remake of The Beatles' Come Together. That was in 1978. Come together, right now. The band was clean, they were energized, and they were ready to pounce, as it were. 
Uh, more than ever, they required surefire hit material for the next album to take full advantage of their uh, newfound momentum with the MTV generation and from the massive airplay of Walk This Way uh, with Run DMC. Kalodner's strategy was for Aerosmith to recruit uh, songwriters outside of the band to collaborate on new songs. Being the accomplished lyricist that he was, Steven Tyler didn't care for that idea. Seriously, someone was going to teach him how to write a song? Aerosmith had never used an outside writer to compose their music, but he knew that they had to make concessions. This was their last chance for redemption, and uh, they were extremely fortunate to have that chance in the first place. Kalodner strongly suggested that they hire Desmond Child, who was highly sought after, you know, fresh from his uh, colossal success writing with Bon Jovi uh, on their mega hits, You Give Love a Bad Name. Then Living on a Prayer. as well as writing one of Kiss's biggest hits, I Was Made For Loving You. Kalodner also wanted the band to hire veteran composer Jim Valance to bolster the writing team and another Bon Jovi alumnus, Bruce Fairbairn. He, of course, produced Slippery When Wet. Kalodner's strategy was not so much about uh, reconnecting with old Aerosmith fans on their next album. The most important thing was to generate a whole new fan base and uh, building an audience of young fans that fueled the MTV generation. <laughs> Exciting that young, active audience was absolutely critical to building the roadmap to spearhead Aerosmith's triumphant comeback that materialized with Aerosmith's ninth studio album, was called Permanent Vacation. It was released in the summer of 1987. As we break down the key songs from Permanent Vacation and this great album, I want to recognize our amazing sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. So here's the deal. When you order a pair of Zennies, you'll actually end up ordering like two or three pair because they have so much variety. You go to their website and they're so cost effective. You spend about the same for three pairs as you would a single pair elsewhere, and it's both quantity and quality. That's the thing. You're going to love the styles. Just go to zenny.com today and see for yourself. All right, back to the big comeback. So to put the Aerosmith comeback in perspective, let's point out what Permanent Vacation achieved. The album sold nearly 6 million units in the U.S., far outselling any of the previous eight Aerosmith LPs, with the exception of Toys in the Attic. Permanent Vacation was also the first album to reach gold or platinum status in the UK. So it really did find a new audience both in and out of the States. The record spawned three top 20 singles. Uh, this is something that Aerosmith had never done off one record, including their highest charting single up to that point. So let's get into those three singles uh, that really rejuvenated Aerosmith standing as one of America's greatest rock bands. Beginning with the provocative lead single, Dude looks like a lady. The bad boys from Boston and co-writer Desmond Child really pushed the envelope with Dude Looks Like a Lady, a song about a dude who is mistaken for a female. What's so crazy about the song is that it's an instant one-listen ditty that everyone sang along to despite its uh, risque subject matter, especially back in the 80s. Most listeners didn't really overanalyze the lyrics. They just liked the song and they sang the heck out of the catchy chorus. But the song did spark controversy. Uh, the idea to write Dude Looks Like a Lady, that actually began with Steven Tyler uh, when he mistook Motley Crue's lead singer Vince Neil for a woman sitting at the end of the bar. Tyler saw Neil's long blonde hair from the back and began to approach thinking it was a woman until Vince Neil turned around and embarrassed his uh, fellow rock star. Tyler's bandmates had fun teasing him the rest of the night about how the dude looked like a lady. And in the book, Walk This Way, the autobiography of Aerosmith, 
Steven Tyler wrote about the day that uh, they met Motley Crue and how every other word out of their mouths was, dude, do this, do that. Where's your car, dude? Dude, where's my car? Where's your car, dude? Motley Crue's Southern Cal vernacular and that comical misunderstanding at the bar led to the concept for this song. Vince Neil got a good laugh about the whole thing too. He is well aware that Dude Looks Like a Lady came from that uh, hilarious incident. Kind of puts the song in perspective from the way it was written. Joe Perry created the main riff for the song. He had an ACDC type sound in mind when he composed it. Tyler also contributed to the musical arrangement of Dude Looks Like a Lady. He listened to Perry's guitar lick and started monkeying with his new Korg DSS-1 sampling keyboard. After a few stabs at other effects, Stephen found the preset for a clavinet and used that sound to frame the song's chorus. Tyler also used the Korg sampler to produce the stutter effect on Perry's guitar riff uh, for the intro. The original title for Dude Looks Like a Lady was actually Cruising for a Lady. Desmond Child boldly shot that down immediately though, opining to Steven Tyler, it's a very boring title. Van Halen wouldn't put that on the B side of their worst record, he added. Tyler gave Child a how dare you look, but he sucked it up and continued to be as congenial as possible to follow the plan. Tyler replied to Child's editorial by revealing that when he began writing the song, he was singing, Dude Looks Like a Lady, Dude Looks Like a Lady. Uh, that line struck Child as being very catchy and more relevant to the, the true story of how the song was actually conceived in the first place. So, Cruising for a Lady became Dude Looks Like a Lady, and the song became an undeniable attention grabber that was selected as uh, one of the first couple singles from Permanent Vacation. Society wasn't uh, as polarizing in 1987, I think, as it is now. The band just accepted the lyrics and went for it, not giving much thought to potentially upsetting anyone. But Doodle Looks Like a Lady was accused of being transphobic, an allegation that Desmond Child and Steven Tyler have refuted. Child has responded to the alleged insensitivity by pointing out the lyric, never judge a book by its cover or who you're gonna love by your lover is meant to be what he termed accepting. MTV pounded the video for Dude Looks Like a Lady that featured drag queens and a cameo by a bearded John Kalodner wearing a white wedding dress. Actually, the video scored two MTV Video Music Award nominations in 1988 in the category of Best Group Video and Best Stage Performance. Dude Looks Like a Lady was placed as the music bed uh, for a prominent montage in the movie Mrs. Doubtfire coming out uh, years later. It's, of course, about a man disguising himself as a woman starring the late Robin Williams. The song was also used in the movie Wayne's World 2. Dude Looks Like a Lady was Aerosmith's second top 15 single, peaking at number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100. It also went to number four on the mainstream rock chart. The second single from Permanent Vacation was actually Hangman Jury. Although it was a solid hit on the mainstream rock chart, it rose to number 14 there. The track didn't crack the Hot 100. Angel was the third single from Permanent Vacation, and it was a monster smash, as well as a serious departure for core Aerosmith fans. The single flew all the way to number three on the Billboard Hot 100, went to number two on the mainstream rock chart in 88. I think all along, Geffen knew the song would be a big hit, but once again, it was about being strategic with the moves to keep Aerosmith on pace for their big comeback. Yes, Angel being a love ballad with lyrics like, you're my angel, come and save me tonight. It didn't live up to Aerosmith's body image. Tonight. 
However, we have to remember that uh, the band's breakout success came from a ballad. It wasn't a love song, but Dream On was a very emotional track. Like Dream On, Angel showcased a Steven Tyler's sometimes underrated vocal resonance. Yeah, I don't know if I can face that. Angel was another Desmond Child co-write. And once again, Steven Tyler and the band had to compromise. Steven Tyler was scared to death of Angel. He apparently cringed at the thought of it being an Aerosmith song. As John Kalodner explained in the band's A Walk This Way biography, Steven Tyler said that I ruined his career by making him write Angel with Desmond Child. Fortunately, Steven Tyler was wrong. That's what he said. Angel inevitably became Aerosmith's second highest charting single next to their number one smash, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, in 98. Speaking of Dream On, uh, one can likely notice a similarity between Angel and Dream On to give the two writers a point of reference. Tyler played Child the opening chord of Dream On to uh, get them into the zone. Steven and Desmond finished the song just a short time later. On the music track for Angel is the musicianship of Drew Arnott uh, on the Mellotron and there's Henry Christian on trumpet. Producer Bruce Fairbairn also played a trumpet part, bowed the cello, and provided background vocals. Angel was the big power ballad from the album in the era of the power ballad. Seemed like if you were a hard rock band or a glam metal band, you had to have that big power ballad, you know, as your second single. That's what it seemed like every time. Now, the third hit song from Permanent Vacation was the fourth single, Ragdoll. Ragdoll, living in a movie. Hot tramp, cutie. Ragdoll was a really important track for the emergence of Aerosmith to the next generation of fans. It was a modern spin on that old Aerosmith magic with their unique brand of bluesy boogie rock full of innuendos and racy audacity. For Ragdoll, the band enlisted two more prolific songwriters when Jim Valance and Holly Knight teamed up with Steven Tyler to write the lyrics. Valance, of course, collaborated on Brian Adams on most of his biggest hits in the 80s, summer of 69. Cuts like a knife. Cuts like a knife. And of course, the number one hit, Heaven. And Holly Knight extended uh, her golden touch for hit songs, courted by you know Pat Benatar. Tina Turner. Patty Smythe. Hey, Among many others, Rod Stewart. I wanna give you my love, Ragdoll kicks off with Joy Kramer's entrancing 1-2-1-2 one, two, one, two lead beat that marshals the track from start to finish. Joe Perry created the main guitar riff for Ragdoll as he usually did, and Valance wrote the bass line. Perry also played the Bayou Bending steel guitar on Ragdoll. <music> Perry's distinctive steel guitar licks are one of the coolest parts of Ragdoll, along with, you know, Steven Tyler scatting at the end of the song. It's just classic Aerosmith. Because of the New Orleans jazz flavor and the horn arrangement by Tom Keenly side, the song was originally named Ragtime, a title that John Kalodner hated and wanted to change. Ragdoll moved to number 17 on the Billboard Hot 100. It went to number 12 on the mainstream rock chart. Now, one of the unheralded tracks on uh, Permanent Vacation is the first cut on the album, Hearts Done Time. <laughs> 
Heart's Done Time is the perfect opening track to seize the new generation of rock fans to the luscious rampaging danger of Aerosmith. Magic Touch uh, was the fifth and final single from Permanent Vacation. A uh, single peaked at number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100. I mean, I remember buying Permanent Vacation in that late summer of 1987 and played it back to back with the other revolutionary albums of that late summer and fall and winter at 87. For about the next year, it was like a merry-go-round of Permanent Vacation, Hysteria, Appetite for Destruction, The Joshua Tree, Faith, A Momentary Lapse of Reason, Girls, 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 White Snake, Self-Titled Kick. This is a little bit before I discovered New Wave completely, but what a phenomenal year for music. I talk about it so much. I was saving up my allowance and probably bought an album a week. I still couldn't keep up with all the amazing albums that came out that year. A permanent Vacation was a spectacular comeback for Aerosmith as the, the record relayed the foundation of their legacy after so much lost time. Throughout the decades that followed, Aerosmith would never falter again. They'd more than live up to their legend as one of the greatest rock and roll bands ever. Leave us a comment about Aerosmith and this amazing comeback. What are your memories or experiences you know, that are associated with these songs and this record? And, of course, the great years of 87 into 88. Let us know below. If you like our videos, we do invite you to subscribe below so that you never miss out. Also, check us out on Patreon and our merch at professorofrock.com. Help us keep the music alive. That's the goal as usual. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>